Good afternoon. My name is Peter Scosi. I'm Executive Vice President here at the Metropolitan Planning Council. I'd like to welcome you to our afternoon roundtable, uh, Freight Driving the Region's Economy. Um, you are going to hear from a couple different uh, segments of panels today, but before I get to that, I wanted to share with you some opening remarks uh, and a few logistics and, and technical issues. If you need uh, the restrooms, there are some keys available up front, and the women's room is to my left and the men's room is to my right. Um, so please feel free if you uh, need to during the program just to get up and use those. Um, we are recording today's program. It'll be available, uh, it has been simulcast on YouTube. It will be available afterwards. Should you care to share it with your friends or relive this 90 minutes at home tonight with your spouse, you can do that. You might have to wait till tomorrow when it goes live, but you can do that. Um, and so please look for a recap email in the next couple of days, which will give you a link to the URL. Uh, and, and do feel free to share that, of course. Um, so ostensibly, we're here to talk about freight today. Obviously an important issue. I think many of you in the room know that better than I do. Uh, a number of, of freight movements come through the region, numbers of trains, um, 1,800 passengers, uh, 2,000 route miles of track in the region. I can go on and on with numerous statistics about uh, the order of magnitude that this region plays in the freight network for the country. But I think many of you know that. Um, many of you are also probably familiar with the CREATE program, our region's plan to invest in freight rail infrastructure to reduce bottlenecks and improve efficiency. Uh, many of you might also know that since CREATE's inception, we've already improved uh, efficiency by 30%, moving trains quicker through the region. So we've seen some progress. Um, what some of you might not know, though, is that we still have some work to do. There is still work ahead of us. And so these projects take time. The CREATE plan takes time. It, is, it was an ambitious plan 10 years ago. It remains an ambitious plan. So not only do we as a region need to continue to focus on CREATE and other freight-related investments, but we need to start thinking about the future as well and what comes next. So largely that is going to be the focus of our panel today. Um, Freight isn't just important, important for the goods and the movements it directly creates. There is a huge manufacturing impact uh, to our region from, from the freight uh, industry. 183 million tons of raw goods come through here. Luann's not waving at me, she's waving at Jeff. Okay, good, just <laughs> clarifying. I thought maybe I had food on me, no, okay. Um, not just the raw goods, the, uh, the large volume of raw goods that comes through, 183 million tons, but that fuels over $206 billion of exports from this region. Um, so the freight rail infrastructure drives a manufacturing economy as well. Um, over the years, we've now seen formerly empty rail containers leaving Chicago and heading back to Asia, Africa, filled with grain. So we're seeing now a, 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 another type of export and high value commodities being shipped. Um, passenger rail, greatly improved by the uh, create and freight rail improvements. Um, Chicago now has, uh, oh, pardon me, um, the $142 million Englewood flyover, which we will see featured in a video shortly, and I'm sure here's some more talk about today. Uh, is going to help alleviate the bottleneck between 78 weekday Metro Rock Island trains and 60 daily freight trains, improving passenger time to the tune of about 7,500 passenger hours of delay a year. So there's a multiple, multiple ripple effect that freight has in the region, um, and it really is somewhat of a, uh, maybe again, not to those of us gathered here in the room today, but to the broader public, something of a sleepy issue and something we all need to be focused on. Um, I mentioned a video we put together on staff. I want to share that with you. I can find my clicker. Here we go. Um, just a brief video on the impacts of CREATE before I introduce the panel. Chicago is a, is a railroad hub and a critical part of the railroad network in the country. 500 freight trains each day come through the Chicago area with over 37,000 individual rail cars. From an economic standpoint, about a quarter of our jobs touch freight in some way or somehow related to the freight industry. 
we have a stamping plant in Chicago Heights and we're sending our stampings, which are your hoods, trunks, door panels, side panels, are coming up all day long and all night long, seven days a week to be assembled at the assembly operation at 130th and Torrance. If something disrupts that supply chain, then we lose production. Without efficient rail service, you can't have efficient commerce. And that's an extremely important part, not only to UPS, but thousands of other businesses. We're a real transportation hub in every respect, but it's, all, it's also been a bottleneck. The Chicago region has been a bottleneck. It takes a lot of time for the trains to get through the Chicago region. The casual observer can tell you what the problem is, is that you have a lot of rail systems coming into one location. When things back up in Chicago, it's a national freight problem that just emanates throughout the U.S. That, of course, makes Chicago and the CREATE project extremely important. The CREATE project is, is I think, one of the models for what public-private partnerships look like in this country. It's a partnership between the state, the city, and the private railroads, and METRA, to think about how we move freight more efficiently in, the, in and through this region. That you have, uh, if you want to say, competitors uh, banded together working collectively with government to improve the overall rail infrastructure. And that's probably one of the most unique things about CREATE. Part of that is our commuter rail network and the difficulty of having both commuter trains and uh, cargo rail on the same tracks. So one of the things that CREATE has done, of course, is to try to separate the two. The rail crossing projects, grade separation projects have all uh, improve vehicular traffic flow, eliminating congestion, uh, saving fuel. The reasons that CREATE has not moved as quickly through its, its priority plan uh, as, as I think everybody would like is the, the shortage of state resources. CREATE must stay in place and be well funded and see its completion. It's important that we move this forward, it's important that we get it done, it's important that we think about how to fund CREATE it to its conclusion. The rail network in Chicago is not only important to the region, it's important to the nation. And the federal government needs to be a participant in funding CREATE. They have so far to a certain extent, but they need to continue that commitment as we try to finish up the projects. There's nothing glamorous or sexy about freight, but it's critical. It's a critical part of, of our region's economic foundation. And so we need to invest in making that system work better. At the end of the day, it's about jobs. Ryan Griffin Stedge Inc. on staff produced that all in-house. And I know uh, you might recognize if you turn to your right or left, a number of the folks in this room were featured on the video. Um, and we thank them for that. <clears throat> Next up, I want to introduce uh, Jeff Shriver and Audrey Winnick. Audrey is with Cambridge Systematic. Jeff is with Chicago Department of Transportation. Uh, to share with you the results of some economic impact analyses on the CREATE project. Jeff? All right, well actually uh, Audrey is going to talk about the impact uh, analysis and I'm just going to give a, a brief uh, over update on the status of a, a lot of the CREATE initiatives. I'm told I only have five minutes, so uh, forgive me if I go uh, too fast through all of this. Um, but as, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, the uh, CREATE program has, has made a lot of progress. Um, alternately, we, we get sort of competing uh, images in the press a lot of times and they're sometimes both mistaken. Sometimes people will say in the press, uh, creates floundering and hasn't accomplished anything and you know how come it's not done yet and then on the other hand we'll have a create project that's finished and then at the press briefing for that somebody in the press will say oh so creates done we've completed it congratulations so, well the truth is somewhere in between the truth is that we've actually made a lot of progress and what I'd like to do is uh, show you a little bit of that progress today I know not everybody in the room is able to get out in the field and, and see a lot of these projects as much as I know some of the people in this room might like to um, and so we can uh, see it uh, here up on the, on the screen instead, and, uh, but, but still emphasize that there's a lot of work that remains to be done. So these are some, some, just some background stats. You saw some of them in the slideshow. Uh, this one's a particularly compelling one, just showing how important Chicago is. Uh, if you just take intermodal uh, freight traffic, that's a containerized uh, freight, 
the uh, ports, seaports all around the world uh, measure their, uh, their uh, um, capacity and, and their performance in terms of how many 20-foot equivalents are, are processed in those seaports. Well, Chicago is not a seaport, but we process lots of containers. And in fact, if you counted up all of the containers we process here, we'd rank the busiest seaport in, in the United States, just as busy as LA Long Beach, and among the 10 busiest in the world. And then for the, the non-containerized freight, the, 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 uh, all the other types of commodities that are sorted in the, the classification yards you see around Chicago and the region, uh, in, in the mid-continent, there's, there's uh, all sorts of terminals where freight is uh, uh, handed off between railroads and sorted among the railroads. And Chicago, just over the volumes of traffic that come through here overwhelm uh, all the other uh, cities in the, in the middle of the country and around all of North America, for that matter. So CREATE, just to, to refresh, comprises 70 projects. Um, uh, many of these projects are, are to improve the, uh, the capacity and the flow of freight trains uh, through, through the region. There's switch and signal uh, projects and adding new track. Um, but 25 of these projects actually also have to do with uh, separating uh, the road from the rails. So they're great separation projects. And, that, and a lot of the benefits of those projects are on the local communities for the automobile, the truck, pedestrian, bike, and transit traffic that, that has to cross uh, tracks that when you make a great separation that uh, no longer has to happen. Uh, six of the projects are actually separating rails from one another. This is particularly important where freight trains and passenger and commuter trains interact. And the passenger and commuter trains want to go quickly and frequently, and the freight trains are long and slow, relatively speaking. And so to, to the extent we can uh, um, separate their movements from each other, all the systems work better together. So this map uh, recaps where the CREATE projects are, primarily to the west and the south and the southwest of the city, which is where the freight uh, rail infrastructure is concentrated uh, for historic reasons getting around the southern tip of Lake Michigan. The uh, uh, funding to date, the CREATE program uh, has uh, the total price tag uh, for, by the current estimates is around $3.8 billion. Um, to date, we've received about $1.2 billion, either in that money that's been spent or money that's been committed from various sources. This is a quick rundown of the, the primary sources that have uh, uh, contributed to CREATE so far. A lot of federal grants, um, very big contributions from the state of Illinois through the capital bills and, and other means, um, some local commitments, as well as uh, um, a very substantial commitment from the freight railroads themselves, primarily on the, uh, the, the freight uh, uh, rail industry and uh, the pro for the projects that are improving a, fr a freight rail. So, so where are we right now? Uh, 70 projects, 22 are complete, and uh, a substantial number, are, uh, nine, are under construction. Uh, there's another 19 that are in various stages of design and planning. Uh, 20 projects have yet to start, but we've uh, just passed a milestone of where we have actually have now more completed projects than projects that have yet to even start. So. So this, this chart, and not all projects are necessarily equal, which this, this chart might imply. I mean, there, there's varying orders of magnitude here. But just in terms of the total count of projects, you can see the red represents completed projects. The gray represents those that have yet to, to begin. And we're, we're making steady, uh, sustained, and steady progress here. But, we, but clearly, we can't stop now. So um, if I'm not already done with my five minutes, I'd like to get to the uh, just a few slides to show you um, um, the status of a number of these projects. A lot of these slides came from uh, Tom Livingston and others in the, the freight uh, uh, industry, and uh, the uh, people have worked on these projects. So I'm, I'm sorry, Bill Thompson. I saw Tom in the back of the room there. Sorry, but <laughs> Bill Thompson uh, gave a lot of these slides. So thanks, thanks everyone who's contributed these slides. So one project is the uh, called the Great Separation Seven Belmont Road out in Downers Grove in DuPage County. This is a, where a metro station is located on the BNSF main line. That project uh, wrapped up uh, last year. It's a, it's a big improvement, a great separation where there's a train station. Another great separation is uh, on 71st Street by Toyota Park. Uh, before, uh, the trains uh, often uh, blocked uh, the, uh, the, the tracks there. This is at the, the entrance to a couple of very important freight railroad yards on the uh, Indiana Harbor Belt and the Belt Railroad and the uh, uh, CSX all come through here a lot. The, uh, um, now there's a, there's a bridge there. The bridge uh, used some pretty uh, uh, innovative construction techniques to, uh, to minimize the disruption on the railroad by building the abutment walls first, as you can see here, and then rolling in uh, 
the bridge uh, when those were ready. And all this uh, kept the, the downtime on the, on the railroad tracks to a minimum so that the railroad would have to be closed like only for periods of maybe 48 or 72 hours to really important constraints uh, when, when dealing with the, the freight, freight trains on very active track. The uh, GS-15A is the 130th and Torrance uh, grade separation right adjacent to the Ford, Mo Ford Motor Company assembly plant. We saw that Ford uh, had a, uh, um, uh, a very uh, um, important uh, role in the, the freight network here. This is the bridge they got rolled in down there. Uh, if anybody has a chance to go out to 130th and Torrance, it's the biggest crate project going on right now, $170 million, two major streets, five bridges. New bridge for the South Shore trains, that's the, the big blue one there. The uh, GS-16A is just west of O'Hare Airport at York and uh, Irving Park Road. It's the Canadian Pacific Railroad getting separated there. Sorry, I'm going so fast. But, uh, GS-25 is uh, uh, Roosevelt Road and uh, uh, Coutts Road in uh, uh, West Chicago and DuPage County. Another very uh, congested, very busy uh, part of, of uh, U Union Pacific's main line and two major uh, roads out in the suburbs. And now they're being brought over the top of the railroad. And there's enough room in that bridge to add more tracks in the future, one of which is currently even being planned. Uh, this is the uh, Englewood flyover that was uh, mentioned earlier. The two uh, red tracks are the ones that just opened a few weeks ago. The blue one is the third uh, track that's now uh, being built now that, uh, now that the Two red ones are, are in service. This carries Metro's Rock Island trains over the top of the uh, Norfolk Southern's uh, main line. It's, uh, we're leaving a lot of, uh, lot of congestion. Amtrak said that was one of the most congested parts getting in and out of uh, Chicago, and now it's uh, completely uh, uh, open. And a few more. All right. Um, other uh, freight-related rail improvements. Um, this is a, a, a Union Pacific project out in the western suburbs going by Proviso Yard, Bellwood, Berkeley, and Maywood. Um, a triple track their, their commuter main line, which is also their, their important freight main line. So uh, commuter trains and freight trains don't conflict with each other. Uh, built two pedestrian tunnels under uh, the tracks at the stations at Bellwood and Berkeley so pedestrians don't have to cross at grade level anymore and when freight trains may be occupying one of those three tracks from time to time and so there's no more uh, uh, problems with trains blocking the pedestrian crossings. It involved, actually it's not what we consider one of our flyover projects, even though it did involve a, a, a giant flyover that's, that's helping to relieve uh, a lot of the traffic before and after the two tracks to three tracks and a flyover. Um, another uh, new project in the south suburbs, sorry, going through. Another restoration of a, of a, of a big, uh, um, a f formerly used but it's been out of service for about 40 years, a track on, along the Western Avenue corridor that's going to tie together Burlington Northern's main line with the old Santa Fe main line, now BNSF R1 railroad, but their railroads had not previously uh, been connected in a way that this uh, connection is going to provide. This, this one's particularly neat because it's restoring uh, a lot of uh, rail infrastructure that had been there in the past, had become disused, and now it's being uh, revitalized, including uh, um, rebuilding some viaducts where there had been viaducts before. And speaking of viaducts, last but not least, just a few pictures of uh, the viaducts in the city of Chicago. It's another part of the CREATE program. Not the structures themselves overhead, but the streets down below. Oftentimes, uh, they would, these viaducts were put in 100 years ago. There's been a lot of freeze and, freeze and thaw damage in the, in the years since, and the, the uh, um, catch basins have filled in, and there's, there's water standing there, and in weather like we have today, it causes a lot of damage. So part of the CREATE program at about you know, on average about $500,000 a piece, we can rebuild the streets underneath these viaducts. And as you can see, these are big improvements, big neighborhood improvements, a lot of benefits pedestrians and uh, uh, handicap users, et cetera. It's, it's, it's not, not all just about trains. So with that, <laughs> I'll hand it over to Audrey and uh, uh, to talk about our uh, benefits assessment. Thank you. All right, well, I also only have five minutes, so it's going to be quick. <laughs> Maybe not quite that quick, but. <laughs> um, so when the CREATE program reached its 10th birthday, which was last year, there was a decision that we should really um, take a look at the full benefits of the, the CREATE program and, and take a look at all the projects again and what they were going to offer in terms of economic benefits. So that is what um, Cambridge Systematics did. We looked at the full program 
all the different types of projects. And one major component of the analysis was looking at the base case versus the full build of the CREATE program in terms of rail traffic control simulation, which the railroads developed and um, gave us outputs so that we could work with in terms of determining what the rail impacts were. That showed that if CREATE were not built, in 2025, the rail network would become saturated. And if CREATE were built, the rail network could, obtain, could handle future demand through 2047. So that's an important kind of underlying foundation in terms of the way all the benefits were created. We, also, we looked at direct benefits that can be quantified. We did not stick this into um, an economic model that uh, spun out indirect benefits. These are all direct benefits. And we looked at 30 years of benefits because the projects have a, a pretty long lifespan. We looked at those 30 years and um, discounted to 2013 dollars, which means that any dollar in the future is, is worth less um, in the future than it is today. So we, we just made those discounts. The categories of benefits we looked at were reduced train delay, both freight and passenger, as well as uh, the auto delay at those grade crossing separations. Uh, increased rail capacity, so by making all these improvements in terms of signalization and switches and third main line, um, what does that do in terms of actually helping the whole rail terminal operate? Safety and um, environmental benefits. I'm gonna get into each of those in a little bit more detail. In terms of the delay, delay reduction, uh, we determined through the simulation that if CREATE were not built, by the time 2025 came along, there would be 160,000 annual hours of train delay. Um, so by not having that, that um, contributes to the benefits. We also determined that without CREATE, motorists at grade separations, motorists, um, truck, truck drivers, um, bus operators, bus riders would experience half a million hours, 500,000 hours every year in terms of delay. So really significant delay here and by not having that, by building all these projects, um, those were the benefits. Motorists also uh, avo will avoid additional truck traffic with the build of CREATE because future demand for freight can be handled on the rail system and doesn't need to be diverted to, to freight, diverted to truck rather. Um, therefore, there's less truck traffic and that affects the highway system um, beneficially. In terms of the increased rail capacity, a major benefit of this program is logistics cost savings because if in 2025 the network is saturated, then a large proportion of the future demand is going to have to go to truck. Uh, essentially imagine you can't take any more rail cars per day in Chicago. How does, how does freight move? A portion of it might go to other rail gateways, but as you can see from the maps that Jeff showed, we're the big kahuna in the country. This is the hub. Uh, this is where all the six class ones are, and so you can't really divert that much traffic to other rail gateways. It's going to get diverted to truck. And so there's, there's major impacts of that in terms of the cost to shippers uh, and also some of the other negative benefits, such as uh, uh, highway pavement damage. The uh, estimates we made were that there would be 5.7 billion vehicle miles of travel um, taken by trucks annually if they were diverted to, uh, diverted to truck from rail. So that's a huge impact. In terms of safety, of course, there are 25 grade crossings right now. Uh, a few of them have been completed. Uh, but by separating all of them, then you completely eliminate the potential for crashes with trucks and, and other vehicles. So there's a huge safety benefit there. And then by removing, by avoiding all that truck VMT that would have to be diverted due to rail saturation, then you're avoiding any truck crashes on the system as well. The safety benefit was, benefit was calculated at $1.8 billion. And then finally, but definitely not the least important, probably the most important, uh, is environment. Uh, because of all these efficiencies in terms of the trains operating more quickly, more efficiently, there's less delay, there's more capacity, 
on the rail system, which consumes less fuel than on the highway system with trucks. There's a lot less fuel consumption in terms of diesel and gasoline. The fuel consumption would be less, will be less uh, at grade crossings because co vehicles don't need to sit there idling. Uh, as, as I mentioned, there are just many, many hours of vehicles idling. Uh, and so the environmental calculations were in terms of those reductions in fuel, as well as the emissions that are created in terms of carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter. But um, these were only the direct benefits that we, we were able to monetize. And anyone that works in benefit cost analysis knows that there are some traditional elements that you can monetize that can be included in benefit analysis, but there are a lot of things you can't uh, quantify that are still really important, um, such as employment, maintaining Chicago as a rail hub, and the logistics business that is part of that is, is really huge. Uh, and, and so we did not, um, in terms of the direct benefits, that is not included in these calculations. Um, travel time reliability, certainly there's a reduction in delay, but we did not, um, we were not able to monetize reliability. Community quality of life is huge, um, for the, especially these 25 communities with grade crossing um, issues. When you remove that barrier in a community, it really changes everything. It makes life so much better for the residents of the communities, as well as makes them really much more competitive for business. Because if, if a business doesn't know if it's going to be able to get trucks across the track, be able to get its employees to work, like we saw with the Ford example, um, they're reluctant to locate right next to those to those barriers. So uh, there's a huge impact uh, to the communities, and of course, uh, emergency response is, is huge in terms of making sure those those roadways are are available and clear at all times. So um, so now you're probably wondering what is the number? What are the benefits? <laughs> all right, now, I'm going to tell you. Um, so the benefits we calculated by including all these factors um, resulted in 28.3 billion dollars uh, over the 30 years. Uh, lifespan of the projects and that is a lot bigger than the investment of 3.8 billion that is estimated right now in terms of the cost of create so um, there's a lot more to be gained by continuing to fund and, and build this program but before I close I'm gonna just share with you one more thing we have um, also been trying to monitor the benefits that are being accrued as on an ongoing basis and one thing that the rail industry does is look at the Chicago Crosstown Transit Time, which is uh, evaluated based on uh, sensors tracking rail cars as they enter into about a 40 mile um, radius. When, once they cross about the EJ and E railroad, they get tracked, and then the time is calculated until they leave the Chicago area. Before Create, this was taking about two days. You may have heard the saying that it takes two days to get to Chicago from the LA, and it takes two days to get through Chicago, and that, that was kind of true, um, to get through Chicago. But since Crete has been, um, the projects, the 22 projects have been built, we're now down to 32 hours, so it's getting closer to one day, and that's, that makes a huge difference. And then if you look at um, unit trains, which are those that in, include um, shipping of a single commodity like coal or ethanol, that's down to less than 15 hours. So there are real benefits accruing, um, as, as Jeff showed in his pictures, um, and as is, is shown here with these rail, rail benefits. So um, we look forward to continuing to build, create, and accruing the full range of benefits that we believe will be enjoyed. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to just interject and thank everyone for bearing with us while we get the temperature control right. Um, if you just stop breathing for about five minutes, I think we can get the temperature down and we should be fine. Uh, next up, I wanted to invite Wes Lujan to the podium. Wes is the System Vice President for Union Pacific. Wes will be introducing our panelists uh, and then engaging them in a discussion. Uh, and then we will be engaging you in that discussion. So think of questions, um, keep, keep those in mind when we're done with the portion with Wes. We'll then turn to you as the audience to ask some questions. There'll be a couple of us floating around with microphones. Um, again, do wait until the microphone gets to you as we are recording and we wanna make sure we capture everyone's question in full. Um, there we go, Wes. Thanks, Peter. Well, good morning, or good early afternoon, I should say. Um, <laughs> you've trained me well. 
<laughs> so with that being said, I just wanted to take a moment just to offer a few comments. Uh, you know, obviously this has been a 10 year venture plus and you know, I just want to compliment also the Union League Club for their involvement earlier on and funding some of the studies. I see some representatives here in the audience that really kind of got the funding going for some of the initial studies that started to be the CREATE program. So it's, uh, it's been a long time coming. That being said, it's a slow, it's a slow roll, but it's, you think about the progress we've made to date with respect to the investment, you know, over 1.2 billion. I mean, Jeff's chart showing the different hundreds of millions of dollars of grants and investment that's been pumped into this. It's really unprecedented. Yesterday, I was up in Minnesota uh, making a presentation to the governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton, about freight rail issues and how we can, <laughs> Tony's, Democrat, yes. de Democrat, yep, <laughs> DFL, DFL. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we're up there making a presentation and, and they're really struggling with trying to understand on how to improve the, the terminal up there in, in St. Paul. And so, you know, I can come to a situation like this and I kept pointing to Chicago, looking at our partnership and all that we've achieved here. It's pretty remarkable. It's really unprecedented. And I think if we can keep that momentum going, that's, that's all the better for us. Um, you know, a lot of times they talk about this stuff in the context of jobs. You know, each one of these projects represents significant investment, a lot of capital, a lot of construction jobs. But I just want to talk about the long-term benefit. You know, when you think about that commuter getting to work every day on time, safely, reliably, that's a factor, factor with the economy. When you look at the rail labor, there's 18,000 railroad employees that work around the Chicago terminal every day. Uh, you know, I see Bob Guy in the audience, and that's one of the things we think about is that, you know, we as Union Pacific, I know the other freight railroads as well, you know, we're up, just our company by ourselves, uh, we're up to about 490 employees year to date in Illinois for new hire, new hire. So that's just here, a lot of that's probably here in, in Chicago, the Chicago area. And then you look at just the overall projects. Um, you know, the region as a whole, uh, it's even though 68 of the 70 projects are in Cook County, uh, when you look at the region, the collar counties, the benefit, the intermodal growth that we see in Will County, for example, a lot of those trains that are getting to Will County do not get there unless they come through Cook County. And the Cook County improvements are really critical to helping uh, the Kane County traffic. When you're sitting at a crossing in DeKalb, uh, at least on our line, the Union Pacific, you know, if there's a block crossing or something slowing down, it's because of something happening in Chicago or in the western suburbs. So it's all, it's all interconnected. Uh, you know, you look at the train performance in the north line, especially north of Lake Bluff for us, where the freight train going to the various coal facilities, if they're not making their meets on time and not getting to that coal plant, they're delaying freight or passenger trains on the north line. So it's all, all tied together. It's a very intricate system. That being said, I just want to move to uh, our introductions. Uh, these ladies don't really need much of an introduction, but I just want to uh, speak to both of their uh, backgrounds briefly. Uh, Representative Neckritz, who's a, been a great friend and great proponent of CREATE since its inception, has been serving in the legislature for about over a decade now. Uh, doesn't seem like it. It's like a yes, light speed. But obviously you've been, <laughs> been very involved in the pension issues, pension reform, and, and we appreciate your focus on, you know, funding the funding of creating the legislative context with the capital bills and the authorization we experienced in 2012. That's really been the 211 million that we received in 2012 uh, to basically push the last tranche of freight rail projects forward, leveraging the private investment. Uh, Mr. Schachter in the audience was instrumental in negotiating that uh, at IDOT, and so we appreciate the work that you did there. Uh, moving over to uh, Cook County President Preckwinkle. Uh, Tony Preckwinkle has been a teacher, been an alderman, and been the president of Cook County. And uh, one of the things I love about Tony is that she really pushes us to think differently and to think harder about these issues. So I want to use today's forum as an opportunity. I see lots of big thinkers in the audience, a lot of people that are interested in these issues. But <clears throat> one of the things we really struggled with with CREATE is how to rebrand it, how to get it uh, positioned for the future. Obviously, we've had tremendous improvements, uh, a lot of progress to date. But really, when we look at how do we move the ball forward, we're kind of, we're really trying to spinning our wheels on that. There's a lot of, there's a path forward, obviously more money. That's pretty logical, right? There's, there's money out there in the, in the government. Uh, and maybe there isn't. Obviously when you look at the fund, the budget, the pension situation with the, the county and with the state, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of competing needs. So um, we're going to use this opportunity to have a dialogue about that. Um, we're going to ask you some questions and, and feel free to uh, speak your mind. So with that said, we're going to open up with uh, couple comments here. <clears throat> Why is freight important to the nation, the county, and the state's economy? So I don't know who wants to lead off with that. <laughs> but, uh. Well, 
First of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. I am I am very grateful to be here and grateful to MPC for for putting on this this forum. I'm I'm a big fan of of railroads. Uh, my grandfathers and my uncles worked on the railroads, uh, the old Great Northern and Northern Pacific, which were uh, uh, lines that went through St. Paul, Minnesota, where I where I grew up. Um, and I've I've come to, of course, to be a big believer in in freight rail as well, both because of its inexpense and in, and because of the ener energy conservation that it represents and the way in which it's tied to economic development, particularly here in the Chicagoland region. Um, I guess when I when I thought about coming today, one of the things I uh, that occurred to me is we've got to figure out a word I saw here in the in my notes where you know re-energize crate. We've got to figure out how to. Um, market what's been done better so that there's a, a broader understanding of the benefits. Um, particularly since the, the money for Create would be concentrated in northeastern Illinois and uh, we have a lot of downstate people to win over if we're going to get state funding, for example. Um, but we have to figure out how to, how to show how beneficial our uh, freight network is for the <laughs> state of Illinois as a whole and how much it contributes to uh, the economic vitality of northeastern Illinois. And one of the things I've, I've tried to do as, as uh, president of Cook County is to try to get the, the leaders of the political leaders, the business leaders, and the economic development professionals to come together about around regional economic development. And we've, we've decided to focus on two things, um, trucking logistics and supporting exporting manufacturers. Um, trucking, of course, is related to rail. It's part of our transportation infrastructure. But if, particularly if we're going to uh, be supporting exporters and they're trying to get their goods to the to the coast, we need to we need to focus on our on our freight rail network. So I'm I, I'm I'm a big believer in freight rail, and I think that those of us who do believe in it have to figure out how to be better advocates for it, both in Washington and, and Springfield, because that's I think where the work has to be done. We hope that uh, in the next couple of years there will be a transportation bill in Washington. We keep our fingers crossed. And that there will be opportunities in the state legislature, although Representative Netkritz may, <laughs> may believe otherwise, given that he says cheerfully. Um, <laughs> there may future, be future opportunities in, in, in Springfield. Um, in addition to the, to the economic development work that I, that I just mentioned earlier, I also want to credit John Yonan, who's in the back. Uh, we're beginning sort of in the middle, beginning is not quite right, of a long-range transportation plan. And we have an advisory council, I think some of the people in this room are members, uh, looking at transport transportation needs for our, for our northeastern Illinois region, and particularly for Cook County, um, going forward. And we have freight, of course, and, and trucking are important parts of, of that, uh, that long-range planning process. So um, John is here and, and will be available to you after the meeting as well if you have comments and concerns and issues that you want to raise um, related to our long-range transportation plan. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm good really, afternoon. Uh, no, good thank afternoon. you. I, and, and I'm really very honored to be um, appearing with the president of the Cook County Board with today. Um, I, uh, first of all, I, I noticed my, my Twitter handle is up there. Um, if you Twitter me, you will not get me. You will indeed get John Amdor, who's getting his master's at UIC in transportation, which is probably better for all of you in the room to reach him rather than me on, <laughs> on these issues. So um, just know that. Uh, I, I got interested in rail uh, when I was first running my, success, my first successful campaign for state representative. Uh, and as I knocked on doors in the city of Des Plaines, everyone complained about the trains in Des Plaines. And for those of you that are not familiar with Des Plaines, there's three class one railroads that form a triangle in downtown Des Plaines. So you can't get anywhere without, without uh, uh, having some interference on one of the trains. And so I set out to go solve this problem for the residents of Des Plaines. And uh, I found out about the CREATE program. And I was like, well, look, that's all in the western suburbs. It's on the west side. It's all on the south side. We need some of this in Des Plaines. So my goal with the CREATE program, when I first found out about it, was to steal some of that money and bring it to Des Plaines. Um, once I figured out that that was probably not going to be possible, and in fact, uh, how important the whole freight system was for our region and for our state, I sort of let go of that goal um, and, uh, and set about uh, just being interested in making sure that this really important part of our economy um, stayed vital and strong, and that's how I got to, um, to, to do some work on CREATE. 
I, I think from the, from the state's perspective, it's really, um, I, I think most, frankly, most legislators experience rail the way that I did when I was first running for office, which is it's a, you know, it, 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 people can't get where they want to go and, and, and residents view it as an inconvenience rather than a, a convenience or a service. Uh, and so that's what legislators hear from folks. So when, when, when you're talking to legislators about rail, you know, they're just like, oh, God, you know, I, I got that train that's blocking my residents from getting anywhere. So I, I don't know how we rebrand that. Uh, but I think that that's, an, that's, A, something important to keep in mind, and B, then I think it's important to, um, as, as Tony said, to engage a whole bunch of players who rely on rail. So it isn't just the railroads, it isn't just um, uh, transportation folks, but it is the business community that relies on that. It's the, the um, you know, MPCs of the world and so forth. To, to really tell that story about how important that is for our region, the employment, um, the uh, the, the manufacturing that's here, is, as, as was mentioned earlier, that whole, and it's hard to paint that picture in like a one pager, that fact sheet that you're gonna give to a legislator or in the three minutes that you have to explain to them why, why create, um, and it, it, which is an acronym that no one knows what it really means, so it, it just, um, no one in the legislature anyway does. Uh, why Jeff that's does. so important, that's you know, and maybe that might be the first rebranding thing as we can figure out why, what, how, to, how to communicate what it actually, what, what the acronym actually stands mm -hmm. for. Um, uh, so I just think that you know it's a, it's a very hard sell, and especially when we in the legislature uh, have been so sporadic about our capital programs, and we don't have an annual capital program. And um, with all the turnover that's occurred, and now with a with a new chief executive, you know, to just constantly be re-educating people and 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 telling people telling that story, it's 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 hard work, and it's a lot of work. Bet. You guys were so efficient in your responses. I think you've hit most of my questions. So <laughs> to get, I'll have to get a little bit creative here. But um, you had mentioned a little bit about constituents, uh, Representative Neckritz. But uh, President Preckwinkle, what do you hear when you're in the community? Uh, what do you hear about railroads? Well, first of all, you know, when I was, when I was an alderman, um, we had to deal with both Metro, which had a com commuter line through my community, and um, Canadian Pacific, Canadian National. Canadian National, Skyline. CN, not CP, yes, CN. Um, and frankly, as a local elected official, it was, it was uh, incredibly frustrating because I could never get anybody at Canadian National to be responsive to the concerns that we had in our community. Sorry. So is there anybody here from Canadian National? <laughs> I was with them yesterday. They're trying to do better. <laughs> they are, they are trying to do better. I'm happy to talk to them after the meeting. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as president of the county, I, um, We've worked with, with Wes at uh, Union Pacific, with Mr. Livingston in the back, uh, CSX, and, uh, and Burlington Northern. So those are the three that we've had uh, a lot of communication and contact with. Um, I've tried to convey to them that, first of all, I believe in railroads, so I'm an advocate. You have to tell me how I can be helpful to you. Um, and my challenge to them has been, as Wes can, um, you know, there have been some of these uh, uh, ads for what Norfolk Southern CSX has done, CSX has done some too we have a couple um, too and a few, a few UP has done some but I would argue that the rail industry as a whole has not made the case to the American people about how critical they are to our economy so that's something I and, and Wes has heard me say this before that's something that I put on the railroads um, if, if you want people to support initiatives to uh, to do things like deal with railroad crossings, you know, vehicular traffic and railroads, or do flyovers or whatever, they have to be persuaded that it's that it's that it's vital to our American economy, that it's not just a uh, giveaway or boondoggle to the railroads, you know. So, and and in order for them to believe that, you've had to make the case about how critical you are to the economy. So, I, my challenge to the railroads always has been, you know, make the case for your industry, and not not necessarily your individual companies, but make the case for your industry. Um, and likewise, on CREATE, uh, what I said earlier is, is, I firmly believe, that we haven't done enough work to persuade the people of Illinois that this, is, this, is incredib this, the, this initiative is incredibly valuable to the state as a whole. And to keep them from thinking that this is just some parochial um, boondoggle uh, for northeastern Illinois, to which there's a lot of hostility elsewhere in the state. Um, now, since, since Northeastern Illinois is the economic engine for the entire state, I always find that a little 
troubling and ironic, but it's nonetheless true politically. And so we have to figure out how we're going to make the case, how the, the railroads have to figure out how they're going to make the case nationally in terms of their criticality to the American economy. And we who believe in railroads, and particularly believe in freight, have to make the case in the state of Illinois about how important northeastern Illinois uh, freight issues are to the economy of the state as a whole. Um, and I'm not saying that's easy, but I don't think we've, I don't think we got the work done yet. And if we're going to continue to, to see funding for the remaining projects in CREATE 1 and hopefully develop a CREATE 2, because I don't think we're done with CREATE 1, um, we have to do that. And hopefully one of the things that comes out of our long-range transportation planning process is a little bit of a path forward in terms of um, our work on freight in this region. Because we've really, um, I think, we don't, we don't want to lose market share to Kansas City. Um, we don't want to lose market share to other places in the Midwest besides Kansas City, which comes immediately to my mind. But, um, and, and the railroads have choices about where they're going to put uh, intermodal facilities, uh, you know, where they're going to put resources. And we don't want them to, to be looking outside of the Chicagoland region as they make those, uh, make those corporate decisions. So we've got to figure out how we can um, move forward th with these projects, which make this region more attractive for, for railroad development, as well as um, uh, being really critical to our local economy. So I guess that's... Yeah, thank you. Um, Representative Neckritz, what do you hear from the business community when you're out there? Uh, I know you've done a great job of engaging the, the chambers of commerce, the manufacturers, and a lot of other folks. Uh, you have a lot of that going on in your district. What, what are you hearing from people? Um, the fact is, Wes, I really don't, I, I was thinking about that. I, I don't really hear anything from the business community in the north and northwest suburbs. Um, other, beyond what I mentioned earlier about the delays, the other things I hear, and it's mostly from the municipalities lately, are some safety concerns about the types of products, the hazardous products, products mm -hmm. that are coming through their communities, and how can they be informed of that, and how can they be prepared um, God forbid if something happens like what happened up in Canada, you know. So that, those are th those would be I think the next most frequent issues that I would hear from those that I represent. Okay, we have some good news coming on that front here. So stay tuned this week. We'll be getting some information on a new application that will be for first responders Great. for identifying tank car materials, um, that kind of thing. So it's called uh, Ask Rail, and it's going to be coming online with Union Pacific and all the class ones. It was done collaboratively. And we'll be getting you information on that. So that I think we'll get launched officially tomorrow with our company and the other railroads are going to be bringing that online as well. So we're hoping that takes a lot of the mystery out of uh, the, the equation for some of the first responders that have concerns about that. I, I would ask in particular that that uh, information be shared with the Homeland Security folks. It will be. Both, both in the, at, at the county level and at the city level because that's where, that's where a lot of that concern gets directed. You bet. You can, bet. I, can I just go back to this question about the business community, though? I think that a, a lot of the... I can imagine that some of the disconnect comes from the fact that they're not they're not receiving their goods um, directly from rail. That's you know there's there's a truck that's delivering that. So a lot of the business community, I'm not sure, like the rest like the rest of the citizenry, doesn't really connect the fact that that most of that trip happened by rail. They just happen to receive it by truck, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. they, so they're not they're not perceiving I think the the benefit that they're getting from uh, from a robust rail system. You bet. I mean, the UPS package that's coming to their door, right. I mean, Ray, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think at peak season, about 92 trains a day are coming into the Chicago hub to process 1.5 million boxes at your facility there in uh, Willow Springs. Um, they're coming by rail and then getting distributed throughout the region. A lot of people don't know that. No, I'm sure I, they think it's all on the brown truck. Sorry. Right. Right. <laughs> it's all right. He likes it. It should be seamless, but, you know. Right. <laughs> <it's> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so does Congress, county board, Springfield legislators, do they feel the urgency to fund CREATE? I mean, this is the big question. I mean, you guys have a lot of competing needs uh, for resources. Uh, is there a sense of urgency to fund CREATE or fund projects like this? Yeah, I, I should let Representative Neckert speak to this, but I think that uh, the fiscal issues that the state faces, including the pension crisis, and what to do about the income tax surcharge uh, kind of overshadow all the other issues. And until those get addressed, I think it's going to be hard to move on to the next level of concerns. In my view, you know, <coughs> K-12 
capital spending by the state is a, is a, is a critical one, but it's a, a tear down from, from uh, pensions and the fiscal crisis. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Representative Neckwitz, I'm sure, has a better sense of it. Well, I think you're absolutely right. But uh, there is a very significant effort. I, I, we had last passed our, 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 a major capital program in 2009. It was supposed to be five years, so obviously that expired this year. And there is a growing sense among legislators that we need to do something to, to replace that. Now, do I think that CREATE is at the top of the list in driving that agenda? No. Um, uh, you know, it's always roads and bridges, uh, you know, and, and I wish it were otherwise, but it's not. But the, as that discussion goes on, it's critical that, that A, those of us in the legislature that support rail um, continue to bring that in as part of the discussion, and B, that those of you who support you know, are, are interested in spending that money or are interested in this in this issue also be talking to legislators about it because that is the only way it will make its way into an, into a priority list on a, on a new capital program. And I, I'm really hopeful that we can not only do some somewhat of a larger capital program, but that we can get back to doing what most states do, which is an annual capital program, so that we've got we don't we're not having to wait five seven in the in the in the you know we wait we waited all the way from 1999 to 2009 before we did a, a major capital bill, I, a state like Illinois just can't afford that. Great, yeah. A lot of people uh, don't realize just the materials, the bulk materials that come into building roads and bridges, uh, come by rail. And so Mr. Thompson was kind enough to forward me a letter uh, a while back about just the concerns of the highway builders that they weren't getting fly ash for their concrete. They weren't going to be able to build, any, build anything. So I think if people can see things more globally, we need to do a better job of translating that. You That's do, because frankly, the road builders are not going to come to legislators and say, oh, by the way, not only do I, I, I want to build your road, I, want, I need to get the materials here, and this is how I do it. They're not going to tell that story. So that's going to be a story. Right. I, I, you know, I, I, that's the first I knew of that. So that yeah. would be a good, a, good part, a good piece of the story to tell. You bet. You bet. Um, so you, Representative Neckrich, you talked about this a little bit with respect to uh, the capital bill opportunities and some things out there. What do you see, you know, the, the income tax expiration that's coming up, do you, do you, what do you see playing out uh, as potential opportunities for a funding discussion in Springfield? Uh, there's a couple of ways, it, well, you know, for months leading up to the election, we all said, well, it depends on what happens on November 4th. And now that the elections happen, we're like, well, nobody quite knows what Governor-elect Browner is going to do, so it'll depend on what he does. So let me start with that caveat, because um, I don't really—I mean, I don't really know what his priorities will be and and mm -hmm. what he's what his vision is for not only dealing with the budget but also dealing with some of these critical infrastructure needs. Um, but uh, I think that um, I think that there's. There will, there, in, despite the fact that it does take a lot of the air out of the room to deal with the budget and with the pension issues, I think that you know people want something good to work on and something that provides them opportunities in their districts to uh, deliver some projects. And so I think that there's, there's, there's starting to, there's really is starting to be a sense of we need to do this, we need to do this infrastructure program, and we need to do it sooner rather than later. And you know that. The hard part is always how you pay for it, uh, but there are some there's some good work I think being done on 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 that front, um, and uh, and that will be that will be the challenge of how to cobble that together. Again, I I hope we, as I always do, I hope we are a little bit more honest about how we we're going to fund this and not rely on something like video gaming to make that happen. You know, which took years to to uh, start really generating any revenue and never did, has, never, has not really fulfilled the promise that, uh, that was made when we passed that bill, um, which impacts the level of the, the, the number of projects we can do, but also what does video gaming have to do with infrastructure? I mean, it just seemed like a, so I think we need to be, hopefully have an honest discussion about how are we gonna fund the infrastructure needs. Can I, can I speak to that? So you I, bet. Uh, so I'm gonna speak as a history teacher <laughs> and not as president of the county for a moment. You know, roads, bridges, canals, rail, you know, that were um, instrumental in the expansion of the country and in the development of the country. Uh, and, and we as Americans were willing at the time to make pretty tremendous investments in those things, um, including the fact that we gave the railroads land. I mean, <laughs> well, we earned it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we built track. Received acres. We gave you the land. <laughs> the country gave the railroads land on which to, to build the infrastructure 
for their business. Um, so we made, we made tremendous public investments in, in transportation, tremendous public investments. Um, but more recently in this country, we haven't been willing to say that these are critical investments. And, um, and partly it's the um, movement toward, toward smaller government. Um, I say this as a Democrat. Movement toward smaller government and um, uh, the sort of toxic environment around um, what government can and, and should do. You know, it, the only way in which we're going to have the resources to do the kind of infrastructure work we need is to raise the taxes. I mean, to, to have the, the, the government have the resources in which to do these projects. And it's, it's hard for elected officials to talk that way because anytime you talk about, you know, raising taxes, the sky falls on you politically. Um, but we need, the, we need money to, <laughs> to build roads, to build bridges, to, to do some of the rail infrastructure work that we need to do. And to pretend otherwise, you know, I think is, is really uh, a disservice to the American people. I mean, we also need money for other things like our public schools, as a teacher, I will say. Um, but, but the whole idea that somehow you're going to, you're going to, government is going to do all these things that it's not going to cost you anything or that it's going to cost you less and that what we ought to have is lower taxes, um, you know, is profoundly discouraging to me. In the first place, because it's not true. You can't do all these things in lower taxes. Um, and because there are such great needs in the country. And, and for me, those needs are, are education and infrastructure because those are the foundation of our economy. If we don't have an educated workforce, and if we don't have good infrastructure, it's very hard for people to create and maintain and expand their businesses. So I think those are two critical needs in the country that can only be funded if we're prepared to tax ourselves and pay for them. Um, I realize that's heresy, but you know, it's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth nonetheless. Yep. Uh, so you referenced the federal government. Is there, given the new Congress and everything that's happening, how do we position ourselves uh, with both the administration and the Congress to, to move the ball forward here? I mean, do we, who do we target, who do we focus on? How do we get our story out there, in your opinion? Well, in terms of infrastructure, you mean? Investments? Yeah, or just create. Infrastructure in general, but create. Well, we've got, as everybody's aware, I'm sure, we have a problem with the motor fuel tax. That is that it's not, um, it's a flat tax as opposed to tied to the cost of gasoline. If we made it a percentage of the, of, of the price of a gallon of gasoline, uh, rather than making it a, you know, a certain number of cents, we would have had a lot more money in our motor fuel tax uh, funds. And because, because we didn't do that and because gas mileage is, cars are getting much better in terms of mileage, um, our motor fuel tax resources have diminished considerably to do a lot of the infrastructure work that that motor fuel tax paid for before. So we're going to have to figure out how to, how to persuade the American people that we need to spend general revenues on infrastructure uh, and or um, uh, tie the, the income tax, I'm sorry, the motor fuel tax to as a percentage of a gallon as opposed to a flat uh, number of cents per gallon. And again, these are, these are tough issues. Um, because it requires persuading people that they need to invest in their government. And if they don't invest in their government, there are consequences for future generations, not just for them, but for their children and their grandchildren. Um, and it's, you know, it's easy to be short-sighted. It's hard to take a long view, um, you know, to plant trees that you will not shade you, but your children and your grandchildren. Um, but that's, I mean, I think that's the obligation of our, of our political leadership, and unfortunately, Elaine accepted. Um, I think often we in the, in the political class fail to talk to people honestly about those issues, you know, and to pretend, as I said, that you can reduce taxes and, and <laughs> increase services, which is ridiculous. Um, you, have to, you have to say to people, we need more resources to do the things you want and the things that this country needs. Great. Thank you. I was just reelected, so I can say all these things. <laughs> <laughs> we're glad you for were. four years, I might yeah. say. I got to go glad, two years. And, so, you know, the the, the to me, the, the biggest asset we have in the state of Illinois for create is Dick Durbin, and that's you know, so we have we have that. Uh, but I think that with, with regard to the rest of the congressional delegation and frankly the delegation in some of our surrounding Midwestern states, um, and I know this will like fall like a, a brick on the 
ears of the railroad guys in the room, but I think that there's a lot of interest in passenger rail. And so to the extent that we can utilize some of the benefits for passenger rail that, that come with CREATE, that's, that's something constituents care more about and, and understand a little bit better, and there's growing demand. And that's not just true in Illinois. You know, the Michigan, to, uh, the um, Chicago to Detroit line, I mean, the governor of Detroit, uh, the governor of Michigan is, 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 is investing in that, and, and his um, DOT is very, very active in that. Um, despite, despite what um, Scott Walker says up in Wisconsin, he's very interested in the, in the Chicago to Milwaukee mm -hmm. run and is investing in it. Um, so I think that there's ways to talk about this, not just in terms of freight, but in, but in terms of the other passenger rail benefits that I think the members of Congress who represent the areas that those lines go through will, should care about. So let's throw that out. It's not here. I mean, we're obviously between us and BNSF and other Class 1, CSX. We all are partners with the passenger railroads. And, I, I know. It's, not, you know, your, and it's we, not your favorite thing, though. This has to pay for its fair share right. of the infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> they make their money on freight. So with that being said, I know we're, having our, our, we're coming up against our time here. So we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Uh, Peter and Chrissy have microphones. Please wait. Uh, I'm going to call on you, and then they're going to come over and give you the mic. So... Uh, who wants to lead off? Thank you, by the way. Great responses. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Mr. Lujan, thanks uh, for your apt um, work so far. I wanted to follow up on that, your thought on uh, rebranding Create, and you mentioned a constituency that we don't see as much, and that's really the it was sort of interesting the discussion on the shippers and that the UPS truck shows up and people don't realize that the sort of low price of goods is partially due to the good work that all the class ones do. But the constituency I was asking about is, you know, I know there's a freight rail advisory council, hopefully it'll exist under the Rauner administration. Is there an opportunity to try to bring some of the shippers like UPS or the other major shippers as more of the face of the need for freight rail investment? Because sort of like the road builders aren't a great face for investing in roads, but, you know, as the direct beneficiary, the people that really benefit from having a robust rail infrastructure, mm -hmm. freight rail infrastructure, and the people that get, you know, probably most of the benefits of that $28 billion, which is impressive, it'd be nice if some of those guys were sort of more a part of this discussion and conversation. So I wanted to know sort of your thoughts, because frankly, I'm not sure that, you know, we advocates really know who those big shippers are and uh, how we can get them more engaged in these transportation funding debates. You bet. Um, <clears throat> the beneficial cargo owners are a major factor in the equation because obviously they're routing the cargo here. Uh, and then you look at the third-party logistics providers like Coyote, C.H. Robinson. They're working with everything from Miller Brewing to uh, other small <laughs> shippers to get their products to market. But then you have your large ones. I'm, I'm more than open, uh, Dan, to having them at the table I know that um, uh, Mr. Drake and some others have been very involved in the Freight Advisory Council that uh, you referenced that was with IDOT. Uh, Ray's a member of that uh, committee, as is my, and I know there's some other folks in the room <clears throat> that are as well. I, I don't think it's a matter of trying to bring them to the table. I think it's trying to figure out how we can use their involvement constructively to help us lobby for uh, additional resources. And that's been one of the big issues. Uh, you know, UPS has been great, but obviously FedEx is a big user, starting to become a bigger user of rail as well. They should be in the room. Uh, you look at uh, the large uh, beneficial cargo owners like Walmart, uh, Target, others that have large facilities that are receiving boxes uh, every day. Also large shippers in the steel business. Um, you know, when I met a representative from U.S. Steel here, I'm saying, hey, come learn about Create. Let's get you briefed. So we got to figure out how to uh, kind of activate them. Uh, there's already a lot of good work being done with some of the larger companies that are really familiar with rail, but we got to get the other groups involved too. Can I just add yeah. something to that too, Wes? Yeah. Because I, I mean, one of the largest users of that is agriculture. Correct. And yeah. uh, and I, I would question whether the Far Illinois Farm Bureau would make create one of their top priorities for a capital program. But they should, and maybe mm -hmm. we could work with them to capitalize on that. And then there's coal and oil, you know, mm -hmm. which are all two other two huge shippers, and um, those folks too ought to be active in the in the create discussion. I agree. So really, looking at the what we call manifest shippers, mm -hmm. the the commodity shippers, yeah. 
getting them involved. I, I agree. I, I do brief the Farm Bureau. I know uh, Mr. Livingston's on a committee right now with the Farm Bureau uh, talking about freight rail issues, but we need, we need to figure out a way to bring them into the circle. And make it a priority for them. Right, right. Yeah. I agree. Okay, any, anybody else? Uh, Mr. Slickman. Thank you. Just a couple comments um, or question. Audrey and Jeff, have you looked at quantifying the benefits to downstream to where the uh, freight starts, like in L.A. or um, the Bay Area or wherever? Because it, it does have an effect that they get stalled here in, in Chicago, creates that ripple effect. And then secondly, could someone summarize where the money's come from to date? Because, you know, it would be helpful to know exactly what the partnership has been in terms of your contribution to paying for the projects. Um, yeah, there was the one slide in my <laughs> I was trying to, I was um, reading your mind. The, uh, and in terms of uh, quantifying benefits for, for outside of Chicago. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> in terms of quantifying benefits for outside of Chicago, we have, um, I don't, we haven't explicitly tried to, made an effort to try to, <laughs> to, to, to quantify that. But we have communicated our message, uh, at least in, in general terms, to the Port of LA Long Beach, to the Port of Seattle Tacoma, to ports of Laredo, to, to all, all these v various areas around the country that, that rely upon getting their products through Chicago. I think it's instructive that there was a time a few years ago that the Port of Seattle Tacoma was out here uh, in, in Chicago and, and talking say that they when they talk um, to to the shipping lines that that they're trying to in, in get interested in coming to Chicago they are in coming to uh, the port of Seattle Tacoma they call themselves the port of Chicago because they have the closest rail distance to getting to Chicago so if you bring your Pacific cargo to uh, Seattle Tacoma it can get to Chicago more quickly so I think th these places are well aware that, that we all have this symbiotic relationship, but I, do you have any more to add on the yeah, quantification? I mean, we, we haven't actually you know, monetized it for them, but there are data sets like the Freight Analysis Framework. It's a federally uh, maintained data set where we have done analysis on a state-by-state -state basis of the volume of freight that goes through Chicago, that touches Chicago. We actually have a national map that weights each state by the volume by, by, by in dollars of their trade with Chicago. So we have those types of tools, um, and we can share them with you. And while we've been saying this, you've been looking at that breakdown that you asked about. So. <laughs> yeah, and I and I just like to add on that that you know when I'm like when I was up in Minnesota yesterday, I'm basically saying, hey, you're impacted by movements that happen in Chicago. You may not think it, but you know routes that are happening through Chicago and going back up through Wisconsin into it's all interdependent, Steve. So I mean, stuff's happening. They need to understand how that impacts them. St. Louis, the same way. Uh, these other areas, they don't understand it. So I think we need to do a better job of getting that in our message when we're meeting with representatives from California. Jeff Denham, the rail committee sub representative Denham, uh, has been out here to Chicago. We've toured him through projects. We've got to keep building that type of dialogue. Um, okay. Chrissy, you had somebody over there. Yep. Uh, I've, we've all watched the uh, Commercials, the class ones have been running, and they are very, very good. But I think they fail to address an information problem that the American people are still suffering from. Uh, we need to not just sell the railroad industry, we need to demystify railroad technology and demystify uh, the railroad industry because the key political decision makers in this country are still baby boomers which means they went to high school and college in the 1970s when everybody believed railroads were going out of business. There were bankruptcies all over, and they grew up with the impression that railroads are technologically obsolete, commercially obsolete. They mm -hmm. don't understand anything about the industry, and we have to reach them at a level uh, 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 deeper than the television commercials because, as we all learned when the Canadian National bought the... Uh, the EJ and E. There are millions of people out there who thought they had an entitlement to see trains going away. And all of a sudden the people of Barrington saw trains coming through their community again. And they had been assured that railroad was going to go out of business and they didn't have to live with those trains. And I think there's still a widespread sense in this country that railroads are or were supposed to be obsolete and people are wondering where are all these trains coming from? 
We have to do a better job of explaining that. Ms. Ogard. Thank you. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last year, we entered into the third worst winter of um, Chicago's history, and um, the entire nation felt um, an acute ripple effect of the failure of transportation in and around Chicago, mostly because of the winter. So we saw service um, issues sort of ripple throughout uh, both eastern portions of the United States as well as western. Was there any type of um, economic impact that looked at had Chicago Create been completed before last winter. I think everybody's expectation when we started Create about 14 years ago that it would only be a couple of year project, mm -hmm. it wouldn't drag on. Um, wasn't that a marketing opportunity to say, um, had we had the money to complete it, this is how we could have blunted that impact. And as we embark on another severe winter, based on today's temperature, maybe, <laughs> um, could we consider that type of um, example to help bring national focus and attention and possibly funding to fixing Chicago Create? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> simple answer, yes, there is an opportunity to market that. I often think about how screwed up things would be if we did not have Create or some of these other investments we've been making uh, through our, just our private capital. I mean, one of the things that gets missed in this story, um, you know, my colleagues in the back of the room can speak to it as well, but you know we've spent a billion dollars of private UP money beyond Create in Illinois, mostly up in this area. I know they've all spent hundreds of millions of dollars, but there's an opportunity to tell a story there that this could have been a lot worse. But it's hard because some of the other railroad, some of the railroads are still feeling the ripple effects of that winter from last year, moving into this one with respect to service issues, et cetera. So. There is an opportunity there to capture that. Um, it's a great suggestion. I think what we need to do is just go back and figure out how we can position these improvements in the context of what's been invested and then the velocity, you know, the, the improvements we've made because that story's not getting out there and we probably need to do a little bit of job of that. So that's a great point. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that. No? Okay. Uh, I see a couple hands over here. Peter, I'll just let you pick them. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Schmidt with Trains Magazine. I wanted to know a little more about what's being done to evaluate uh, the projects as time goes on. As Create was well created more than a decade ago, and some of these projects have sat for a decade. So what is being done as railroading changes and crude oil comes in and grain gets more important? How are the projects being reevaluated? That's a good question. I'll defer to the technological <laughs> pros on that. <laughs> Well, well, Crate has, has not remained static since, since 2003 when it was first announced. There, there have been uh, tweaks and adjustments. I mean, we do realize the industry and the nature of demands changes, and, and, and we as the, the Crate partners and the technical team behind it are constantly reassessing what's needed and what's scoped in these projects. Now, the, the changes haven't been dramatic, but, 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 you know, but we are trying to pay attention to, to those, sorts of, those sorts of issues. So. And especially on grade separations, you know, I've had this conversation with President Preckwinkle and other county leaders that, you know, outside of the uh, projects in the city, oh, excuse me, outside of the projects in the city um, that are prioritized, you know, CDOT's going to know their priorities for projects in the city and the others, you know, we need to look at is grade separation X, GSX still relevant to the transportation demand? And I think that's some of the work that uh, Mr. Yonan's doing with the plan that uh, President Preckwinkle referenced. So, you know, that's something we're just going to have to keep retooling. But with respect to the freight rail projects, and I think the passenger rail projects too, we still know that those are relevant. Oh, okay. Jonathan Perman, Public Affairs. Most modes of transportation are publicly owned and, and operated. I mean, think about an airport, think about our roads and bridges. Yes, there are some roads that are now privately owned, but rail is fundamentally different. It's a privately owned enterprise. To what extent is the funding challenges that you face impacted by that distinction? I'm wondering. It, it's clearly a challenge in the state legislature. Why do we need to give the railroads anything? They own, you know, the, 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 they're private companies making a profit. Why do we need to do that? And so there's a, um, and an education process that, that needs to go on. 
um, you know, whether it's an accident of history or, you know, or a good thing, I, we're, we're too far down the path on that. But um, I, I, it, it, it does create some, some hurdles that, uh, but, I don't, but I don't think it necessarily puts rail at a disadvantage when it comes to the discussions that at least go on in the state legislature. Um, it's a question that comes up. I think it's fairly easily handled, but it, it's overcoming, or there is a perception problem. And just really quickly to tack on to that, I mean, when you look at what we're spending cap in our, what we call our CapEx or capital, you know, BNSF, you know, I hate to give these guys too much credit, but, you know, five point, what, five plus billion dollars of uh, capital spends happening this year with their company, 4.1 billion for ours. I think the, the public investment argument is you're getting it that much farther for the public benefits, for the passenger rail benefits that are associated with a lot of these projects. That's really what got us into the create discussion to begin with was the, uh, the fact that six hours every day, our freight networks shut down to accommodate the passenger operation. If there is a way to synergize that so that we're moving UPS's Z, what we call Z trains, to their destination and moving the passengers, we all win, right? So that's, I think that's the argument. Okay, uh, any, anybody, anybody else? Any other questions? Oh. We probably, oh, we probably need to wrap, I'm getting the hook here. How about this? Uh, we'll just go ahead and wrap this up. We appreciate our, our panelists speaking on their, these issues and appreciate you pushing us to get better all the time. And if you have uh, other questions, feel free to take them offline. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. If I could just have your attention for just two more seconds, I wanted to make a couple of announcements. Again, my thanks, MPCs, thanks to all the panelists that participated today. Uh, today's discussion about freight and CREATE is just one of the policy roundtable discussions that MPC engages in. Uh, we do have another uh, two more events coming up before the end of the year, and I wanted to draw your attention to them. Um, an Urban Think and Drink is going to be taking place this week on Thursday, 5.30 to 7, Keith Hampton from Rutgers University will be talking about how technology impacts public space. So if you'd like to join us at 5.30, uh, it's called Think and Drink for a Reason. Goose Island is our sponsor, um, so please do come and join us. Um, secondly, on December 9th, we have another roundtable coming up around government efficiency, looking at how to make uh, not only, well, Illinois is well known for its proficiency of gov local governments, about 7,000 in the state. Um, there are many who want to eliminate some of those, but there are certainly ways to make them more efficient through collaboration and cooperation. So we are also exploring some of those uh, paths as well. Uh, many might be familiar with the good work of Chairman Dan Cronin in DuPage County on that front. Uh, we will be discussing that and featuring that at that roundtable on the 9th. So uh, with that, I do think we are concluded. I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, if you have any lunch boxes, if you're able to neatly take them and throw them away, fine. If not, just tuck them under your chair so your neighbor doesn't step on them. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>